Ryan Weber, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, John. You've been an inspiration to me for a long time for one big reason. You're an action-oriented person. You're not someone that talks about it. You go do it. You're always taking the next first step. Where'd that come from? Um, because I wasn't like this. <laughs> um, I was very bad at, at talking and having really good ideas and never following through and then seeing other people execute on my ideas and then see it work. And I'm like, man, what if I actually just did things? And it doesn't have to be perfect. It just generally done is better than perfect. And once I heard somebody tell me that, I can't remember who or where I read it. When I read that, I was like, wow. And when I started just getting things done, tons and tons of just more opportunities fell on my lap. People tend to not take that action because there's some fear going on in their life. It could be the fear of someone it not working out. It could mm -hmm. be the fear of failure. It could be the fear of X. When I say the word fear to you, where does your mind go? Was that a reason why you weren't going before? I mean, it was fear. It's fear of probably failure. You know, mm. I, I don't, I'm a football player. I, I played college football. We don't like to fail. You know, our goal was to win as many things as we could win the play, win the game, win the day. And if you do something that you don't know if you can win, well, why would you want to follow through with it? And, you know, that's not always the best thought process. And that was what mine was before until I said, well, let's just start putting things out there. And the thing is, putting it out there is the win rather than looking at the end result. Hmm. And there was a, sounds like there was a shift that happened for you there. Yeah. I mean, I, I failed a lot. You know? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's truly what there's it an, is. There's an old quote. It says, uh, failure is not final. Failure is feedback. And it's so true, but it's difficult to undertake, particularly when you're going to ship creative work because creative work by its nature, some people, one person is going to walk by the painting and love it. The next person will be like, that's the worst painting I've ever seen. Yep. So you've been in the creative field or industry now with the content creation and videos and production. You have your own company. There's a law firm involved. Uh, when you think of why people should be more creative, why should people do more creative things? Well, the thing is, I don't consider myself creative. And, hmm. and it's just kind of, I didn't look at myself as a creative or somebody that creates. However, people are gravitated towards watching things be built. You know, they want to see, you know, a quote is how the sausage gets made. Yeah. And they, they want to see the behind the scenes of the creation. They don't want to always see the end product. They want to watch the struggle and see how stuff happens rather than just kind of, well, that's, that is what it is. I can't buy into that storyline. I can't, um, do business with that. And the more creative you get, the more you can evolve and change. And, you know, you're not getting stagnant. You're always kind of looking for new things to, to kind of move forward and keep kind of chugging up the hill. Do, do enough companies share the struggle that they're on the no. journey that they're on no. to, they just share the end product. Of course. I mean, why would you want to show yourself failing? It's hmm. scary. Why You think you're going to lose customers because they saw something didn't work out. But I think you're actually going to gain customers because they see you found that before it went to market. And then you showed how you guys fixed it. Hmm. Let's take an example. Yeah. The mortgage industry. Movement mortgage. Yeah. I have a client that's in the movement mortgage. Okay. Movement mortgage is an example, a uh, purpose driven organization, uh, phenomenal CEO. They do a lot of great things on the outside. They might just show the number of closings that they did this year or this month or this quarter. That would be the export of what they showed. Mm -hmm. What could movement mortgage or anybody listening now thinking of it from a leadership perspective of the things happening in their team what could they show building up to that that would be the audience or a LinkedIn or an Instagram or a TikTok would find interest in that that could eventually bring them more customers in the future? I mean, there, there's so many things, but I mean, just you, John, like you've bought houses. Do yeah. you know what actually underwriting is? You, you, you know, like, hey, we're going to underwriting. They're looking at stuff, but like, what are they doing? What are they looking for? How mm -hmm. are they breaking down these numbers? Because the more educated I can be on that process, the more comfortable I'm going to be. Well, if movement mortgage is the only one explaining what that actually means, I feel comfortable going to underwriting. Mm. Also, on the front end, like I know movement mortgage has 
uh, they tell a lot of stories. They go to underprivileged neighborhoods and they help people with um, their education. They're building movement schools and stuff like that. Well, the stories of people struggling and then finding success is the hero's journey. Mm. You know, you want to help somebody go from, I didn't know what my education was going to be. I got into movement school. I'm now going to college because I had a better education than I would have at public school. I went from not owning a house to then financing my first house. And now I've leveled up to my second house and it's big enough for me and my family of a back dog, you know, backyard right. for the dog and all that. So walking people through the success story of what it's like working with, with your company or your product or, you know, from struggle to success is the story that every movie is built on. But we just don't tend to think about that in our companies or as a leader of a team. We don't think about publicizing that struggle or even documenting at all Yeah, uh, be- because of potentially fear or not, or the fear of not having the skills or to do it. Or people think it's boring. Hmm. Like, I mean, underwriting sounds boring. I, I mean, it does not sound exciting at all. However, people that are, are going through underwriting, that's when it's important. important. They need to know what that is. I mean, you could walk people through what that journey looks like if you are, you know, kind of canceled during underwriting and then how we get you back to, you know, oh, actually we're able to save this loan and you can actually get the house. Hmm. So, you know, there's a lot of ways to show what it is that you do to package something together to say like, hey, client, don't worry, we've got your back. There's a couple of topics I, d- I want to go specifically for you, thinking of our audience, uh, a leader, an executive, maybe uh, working in a bigger company or a smaller company. They care a lot about leadership and people and their development. But there's this like wrestling match with my own personal brand. Mm-hmm. Not that I'm wanting maybe to go be a creator or go build my own company. Should every professional, every leader, every executive be thinking about their personal brand when it comes to marketing or, or should it just be heads down, do my job, lead my team? I mean, I'm, I'm a big proponent of personal branding. People buy from people. You know, it doesn't matter where John Eads goes. I'm probably going to buy whatever it is because I trust you. I vetted you. And if you're within that company telling me that, you know, I believe in this, I'm I'm probably going to be fine with it. Mm. So people are going to build these relationships with leaders. And wherever you go, if you have your own personal brand, you're the trusted person. They want to follow you. And so if you can build your own little network of, of people that trust you, wherever you go, you're, you're going to be successful because you've developed into that. It's, um, it, it's an interesting concept. I know right now at, in the law firm that you're a part of, you're hiring. Mm-hmm. You just talked about documenting the struggle. You then just talked about personal brand. And when you put all these things together, what it tends to do is you become a more attractive place for talented people to come work. So you know, story for you. Cause you're, you're the story guy. I'll yeah. tell you a story. I had a phone call this morning. Um, guy that's been in the title world, you know, title abstractor for 16 years. This is the role that we're hiring for. Um, it's hard to find these people. And I said, you know, hey, this is about our business. This is what we're looking for. So yeah, 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 that's fine. I looked you guys up. I live right down the road. I drove by your office today. What you guys are doing on social media, I've never seen a a law firm do. You guys look like you're fun. You guys look like you have a good time. You're, you're putting out educational videos that, you know, clients probably don't have many questions to you guys. Like, correct. (laughs) That's why we do it. He's like, yeah, I'd love to, to further this conversation. This is a guy that we thought we'd never be able to get, but he's in our industry, that's a top talented, you know, guy that has the experience that we're looking for. And he looked at us and was like, you're doing things different. I want to, I want to be a part of that. It is so important. We tend to think as leaders that talented people are just going to find us or that it's HR's job to find or a recruiter's job. The best leaders are constantly looking for talented people to join them and personal brand and telling your story and content like this can be a phenomenal tool to recruit talented people into it. Mm. He said, he said, is your wife the one that's on YouTube? <laughs> I said, yeah, that, that's her. He said, well, you know, the North Carolina contract got changed this year, right? I'm like, yeah. 
He said, I actually sent that video around our office at his law firm that he's working at. Oh, that's so good. So, you know, that's... It, it works and it matters, doesn't it? Yeah. You've now been around a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, organizational leaders. You've created content for lots of companies. When you start to reflect on the best leaders that you've watched, maybe even played for in football, what are the attributes or skills that stand out to you? I think... Honestly, my, my head football coach that I played for, um, he coached at Wingate University for 23 years. He just retired, I quote it, because he's now the AD. Okay. Um, and I take a lot of my principles from business from what he instilled. My wife, just, I just interviewed him for a podcast, and my wife listened to it. She said, you say all these things that he's saying in the podcast. I'm like, where would you think I developed yeah. that? But it's, it's the resiliency of when, when things don't go right, how do you bounce back? It's not looking at things as a negative. Everything's always a positive. It's not a, oh no, this is happening. It's a, great, that happened. What's the next step so we can prevent it and move on? So, you know, that's probably one of the bigger things. And the the other one is is kind of the confidence. Like you really truly believe in what it is that you're doing, what it is that you're saying. You're not putting on an act. It's It's no... There's no frills. It's I, I believe in this. I trust it. I'm I'm an expert in this. I'm I'm not kind of hiding anything. I'm I'm being myself. Hmm. There's two things there. One, authenticity, it sounds like that last one where it's like, I want a, a leader that's authentic and authentic authentic. <laughs> authentic. Authentic. <laughs> and then most importantly, believes in them and the people that they're getting the opportunity to lead. Correct. Uh, the reality is leadership is a transfer of belief and mm -hmm. you're, you're doing that all the time in the, your body language and the way you talk and the way that you walk uh, and the way that you coach and the way that you teach and how much that of that rubbed off on you with your college football coach. Now the AD to this day, it made an impact on you the right. way he believed either in you or what you were trying to do. Mm -hmm. And now you're trying to bring that to Thomas and Weber, mm -hmm. which I think is amazing. Um, and the other one that you mentioned specifically around kind of responding and that kind of next play mentality and not getting too caught up in it. I love this story. You said I'm the story guy, so I'm going to tell you. <laughs> um, and you might've heard this, but it's a, it's about the old man and his son and they're farmers and they have one son, uh, one horse. And one day the horse gets up, runs away and all the villagers come to the guy and they're like, Oh my gosh, that's so bad. Your horse ran away. How are you going to farm? You're not going to be able to make money. And he said, maybe so, maybe not. The next day that that horse that ran away came back with 10 wild horses. Now he has 11 horses to farm and all the villagers say, Oh my gosh, you're so lucky. You're going to be the number one <laughs> farmer in the village. And he says, maybe so, maybe not. Mm. The next day, the sun's out training the wild horses and it bucks them off and it breaks his leg. And all the villagers say, Oh my gosh, you're so unlucky. He broke your son's leg. He says, maybe so, maybe not. The next day the army comes by to do a draft and they can't take his son because it's a broken leg. The villagers say, Oh my gosh, you're so lucky. He says, maybe so, maybe not. The, the point of this story ultimately is that we don't always know what's whether it was good or bad and what happened, just like your football coach. He didn't always know whether he didn't like losing. It didn't mean he had to like losing that game to win throw up or whoever that y'all lost to. But he, he was next play mentality. Maybe that's going to make us better in the future. Maybe we're going to learn something from it that we didn't learn before. And that is a leadership skill. Mm -hmm. I think so, you know, one of, one of the stories that, or one of the principles that he instilled that I carry to this day, and I, I mentioned it to him before our podcast. He's like, oh, I've got a new one. <laughs> um, he did this thing called the commitment continuum. I don't know if you've ever heard of this one, but with a team, you're always having people that are leaders and followers. Mm. So you could either be on the leadership side where you pull people in your direction, mm -hmm. or you could be a follower where you're somebody that goes and gravitates towards leaders. Mm -hmm. But on the continuum, you have for the good and for the bad, and mm. it's just line. So you have leaders for the good and leaders for the bad. Then you have the people in the middle, which are the followers. Your goal is to get more leaders for the good, pulling the followers in the right direction. Mm. Because if you have the negative people for the bad, pulling the followers, you're going to have a, a really bad situation. And we, we always talked about this at the beginning of the season of how committed are you to 
the team for the good because mm. not everybody's a leader, but the leaders need to pull people in the right direction. And if we can get more people moving for the good, we're always going to have a really successful the commitment team. continuum. Yes. Which is so powerful because negativity spreads like a cancer, yep. uh, as my friend John Gordon calls them, energy vampires. Mm -hmm. They just suck from a team. They pull the energy out of it. You've had some experience of this, particularly lately, of looking at organization or and Tiff looking at the organization. How do we get more of the right people on the team, rowing in the same direction, yep. being positive, being follower leader, but on the commitment continuum, mm -hmm. as you suggest. How important is it to get negative and detractors off your team? I mean, I think anybody listening to this knows how bad that can – I mean, it's, it's truly a cancer. You could be the healthiest person in the world. Everything in your body is working optimally. You could be running five-minute miles. You could lift 500 pounds. It doesn't matter. But if you get a cancer that is uncurable, it's going to end you. Hmm. And that is the same within a business – because they can start pulling people in the wrong direction, just like cancer cells. They start making all the other cells bad, and then it, it, it makes it die. Hmm. And so you, you've got to get the cancer out, then you can go back to living your good life, or you're going to end up not being able to solve it. Why do organizations fail to remove the cancer? It's hard. Hmm. It's hard. I mean, our situation is, you know, my wife really cares about people, and so she couldn't pull the trigger on a cancer, even though they were making the business bad because she wanted to help that person hmm. try and turn them around. I can turn them around. You know, not all cancer's curable. Some is though. That's what makes it tricky. Some, that's right. That's what makes it tricky that uh, some cancer is curable. And, and I come from the perspective that people can change. And that's why I love when people give people a shot to change, yeah. a, a chance to change. Absolutely. But then there's also got to be a, a boundary that you draw. The best leaders, what we've seen is that they, they're demanding, but they care at a deep level. They're, they care about the human, but they also have a high bar of what's expected. And they're, they're not willing to lower the bar no matter how much they care. I think that's the biggest point for what happened at our situation is, we were going to have to lower the bar. Hmm. And that was the, the, the end point. Like the bar cannot get lowered. Well, let's end on some fun stuff. Yeah. You've been so gracious with your time. Uh, you are married to a phenomenal leader. How does it feel to be the second best leader in your house? I, I mean, it's not a shock to anybody. <laughs> I, anybody I meet, I will tell you, my wife might be the smartest person I've ever met. Uh. She retains knowledge better than most people I've, literally ever talked to hmm. and she just she can grind she's she's a, good but she's thoughtful and she's witty and she cares there's a there's so many great attributes nobody's perfect but uh the world needs more powerful women leader like tiffany weber and there's no doubt about that yeah i love i love uh I, i'm a big proponent of celebrating female you know leadership mm -hmm. and females that are are doing well um, because it's just not common. And so I'm very proud to say, like, my wife is smarter than me. My <laughs> wife is better than me in all aspects. Prettier than you. Yeah, I mean, just all everything. Of it. I'm very proud to say that. Well, uh, one of my favorite questions to ask to end shows, um, you got a daughter at home now. You've built a couple great businesses. You're a part of good businesses. You're a good business person. Uh, what's harder, leading at work or leading at home? Uh, probably at home because you're too emotionally attached to at home. At business, I feel like I'm more of a numbers, financial, analytical guy. I don't really get too attached emotionally. But at home, I mean, if she wants anything, she gets it. <laughs> it's not a question. All right. Well, we got to start leading her better. Then, <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, it's bad. Thanks so much for being here. Where can people learn more about you, the work, the podcast you're doing? Where's the best place to point people? Jeez. Uh, probably the easiest one to follow is The Real Estate Show um, and The Real Estate Lawyer. You know, that's our podcast, The Real Estate Show. The Real Estate Lawyer is our YouTube channel. That's where most of my work goes. You know, you'll see what I can do with that. But um, the law firm. If you want to buy or have to sell a house in North Carolina, come close it at Thomas. Weber. That's awesome. Thanks for being here. Yes, sir.